Progress. Hey, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have and the time that we have to study together. And we invite your Holy Spirit to be here as we open your word, as we try to understand um, thoroughly the prophecies, Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And particularly, Lord, the prophecy as it relates uh, to our time. We pray that you can be with each person, that you can help us intellectually and spiritually to understand things, that you can help us in our personal life, that you can bring a conviction uh, to us and the strength and power cool. to obey your word. Be with each person now. Be with us in our study. May you guide and direct us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so happy sabbath everyone um you can see on your screen and paper which i emailed out and we're going to go through this now i don't know how many people have ever read bob pickles material but he's a good solid adventist uh very much uh based on um the understanding of the pioneers. And in this case, he's going to be presenting the view of the pioneers, that is the views that Miller, Josiah Litch, uh, Joseph Bates, and, and we also had read an article where Uriah Smith put forward this view as the view of the pioneers. So Bob Pickle does a good job at looking at the problem. And um, the reason why we're studying this just for a review, is that we're trying to understand um, several different things. So we know that, that Collins put forth an idea uh, regarding how we are to understand um, the, the presidents of the United States. So this main study of this series is, is on the presidents of the United States. And we also looked at a study of Odilio's where he, he does a similar type of comparison uh, with the emperors. And so we've looked at a Dilio study. And then last week we looked at Revelation chapter 12. And what we were really trying to understand is the differences between the beasts in Revelation 12, 13, and 17, and how we can make these applications uh, that we are, we, we've been making. So this is not a definitive study here. I'm not, I'm not saying this is how we should understand things. What we're doing is we're examining the foundation of how Millerites understood things and trying to build up from there. So we're trying to see how God has unfolded light uh, to Adventism and to this movement. Now, one of the things that we found as we were going through our whole series of understanding the foundations is that there is many things that we had uh, mis misunderstandings regarding, or actually just false understandings of what the Millerites thought. And we found that there were things that they thought that were partially true, but because of the perspective that they had, they couldn't see beyond that. So just because the Millerites had a view doesn't necessarily mean it's correct, but it does mean that we should look at that view and understand why that view would need to be unfolded in our time. That is the principles of Miller's methods, Miller's rules. We have to apply those to what were understood in the past. And if we have any new light, we know that all new light is an unfolding of established truths and that it doesn't contradict the old light. It adds to it. So, when, I, when we look at this study on Revelation 12, 13, and 17, one of the things we have noted is that the view, and this would be quite controversial in this movement because we've held this for a long time, but the view that the, the kingdoms are Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, Rome pagan and papal, uh, then the United States, and then the United Nations is actually a really new view. It's not something that was understood by the pioneers at all. And 
And yet we put a lot of weight on it. And the question is, is there validity in that view? And if there is, how are we going to show that? How are we going to show that uh, the Millerites were partially right, but there's things that they couldn't see? So we're not going to resolve all these things in this study today. Um, <clears throat> we don't know how long it's going to take us to resolve everything. But we're hoping as we continue to go through these studies that we continue to learn and understand the problems and also that we're corrected in er places where we have error. So, you know, this is, of course, a participation study. I look forward to uh, people's observations. And we're going to read through Bob Pickle's paper. I, I've thought of, you know, doing sort of a summary of it, but I, I didn't think that it's such a concise paper in some ways. There's some parts that we can skip. Uh, where he does some of this elimination of things that we're not even looking at. But it, but it is a pretty concise paper. He, he brings things together um, so that we can look at them. And, it, and it's not a rhetorical type of paper. It's not, it's not a paper that's uh, um, polemical in any way. He's not trying to, to – um, he's not trying to make an argument and hide what he's doing. He's trying to be as open as he can. He's trying to look at the problem in a real way. Um, though there still would be biases like any person has. Um, so we're going to, and we can't talk to him personally. I mean, maybe I could have tried to track him down and invite him to this study. But the last time I've tried to do that, I found that the person had passed away. And I don't want to find that out with Bob Pickle. So um, we're just going to start reading here. <clears throat> now, the, the question that he's asking is, who are the seven who are these seven kings? So this is really Revelation 17. But what I'm really trying to focus on right now is actually the beasts of Revelation 13. Uh, we're going to address Revelation 17 in a lot more detail later on. So he says, in Revelation 17, John sees a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast. The beast has seven heads and ten horns. Who is the woman, and what are the heads? So the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And here is a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The city that reigned over the kings of the earth for so long and which sits on seven hills is unquestionably Rome. Somehow connected with this scene are seven kings. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, he's going to bring some points here of things that we actually looked at because we did look at Ralph Meyer's uh, paper where he tries to uh, present the seven kings as seven, as the names of seven popes, not actually seven individual popes, which is quite a different view than a lot of people have when they try to label them popes uh, from the Lateran Treaty time to our time. Um, so it says, um, it is these seven kings that we want to deal with in this paper. Basically, there are three different interpretations that should could be considered about who these seven kings are. Seven individual kings, and this interpretation has a couple of variations. Some try to identify seven individual emperors, a typical preterist view, and other seven individual popes. So remember, when we were looking at Odilios, Odilio wasn't really making this argument from Revelation 17, but he was taking that Nero was uh, this, this parallel with Trump, that it had to do with July 18th, because Nero is going to burn Rome in, in, on July 18th in, um, is it 54? 54 AD, yeah, I think it was or 64. I can't remember, 64, I think. I think he starts his reign in 54. So in 64 AD, if, if I'm wrong, somebody can correct me. Um, so, so we see the preterist view, they're going to try to label them as emperors. And that's what we were trying to look at, is if we were going to label, label them as emperors last week, you know, how would we do that? Um, and then there's others that they label them as individual popes. So I've told a story where we had a pastor 
who did all day sermon Sabbath, trying to convince us that the seven heads were seven popes, counting from 1929. Um, now, the most common one we see is seven kingdoms. That's, that's the position that this movement has. Um, we have the view it's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal. Um, and then there's other people who have different lists, right? And then we would have, of course, the United States being the sixth, and then the seventh is going to be the UN. Then uh, another view, and this is the pioneer view, that it's seven forms of Roman, Roman government. And this interpretation typically identifies the first five kings as five of the following forms of government. Kings, consuls, dictators, decemvirats, military tribunes, consular power, and which is military tribunes with consular power, and the triumvirate. So this to me, when I first heard this view, um, it just didn't, it didn't really click with me at all what was being talked about. I didn't quite understand uh, the position. Um, but it, actually looking back in history, and I, and I made the statement that, you know, they just sort of seemed like cherry picking that there was different forms of government. But actually, um, it seems to be pretty solid because Rome started with the kings, it was kings, and then they they move through these different forms of government. Now, dictators are something that we, we always think of it as a, as a bad thing, like a permanent dictator. But they would do this in times of war, is they would declare somebody as a dictator for a short period of time. And, um, and this was to cut through a lot of the bureaucracy so that they could deal with whatever this crisis was. So it wasn't really seen as something in a negative sense. It was something that was always temporary. Uh, until we got to Julius Caesar, and then we ended up with the emperors. So we can see that Triumvirate is uh, the fifth one. <clears throat> so one of the most important questions that needs to be answered is, when is it true that five kings have fallen? Now, this is another issue that comes in the context of how we understand um, prophecy. That is, when a prophet is speaking, and he's speaking about something in the past or something in the present or something in the future. The question is, what time is that prophet in? And that prophet isn't always in uh, the time in which he's writing. So we know that that's the case. And, and he can be transported to a different time. You know, an example of this, where is what time is Daniel in in Daniel chapter 8? Anybody know? When, did, when does he write the chapter in Daniel chapter 8? I think he's in Persia. Okay. He's actually in the time of the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar which is 19 years uh, prior to uh, the decree of uh, Cyrus. So he's not in the time of Persia personally when he wrote it, but in vision, he is in Persia, correct? Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Okay. So he's going to be brought into the future to Shushan in the palace. Now, Daniel, of course, when I say he wrote it, when he received the vision was in the third year of the king, reign of King Belshazzar. But he put together the book of Daniel near the end of his life. So he collected these visions. Um, he would never have been in Shushan, the palace, at the time he was the king, uh, that, that he was serving King Belshazzar. He was under, he was in Babylon. He wasn't in Persia. It's quite a far way away. And, and actually, the evidence is that the Shushan in the palace didn't even exist until much later, so that there wouldn't be, at that time, this palace in Shushan. So, so he's being brought into the future, which he can only recognize later when per Persia conquers Babylon. 
So he's brought into the future. So he's going to write from the position of being in the kingdom of Persia. And that's why the 2300 days starts at the time of Persia. Not because he's in the time of Persia. It doesn't start with Babylon. It starts with the Persian ram with two horns. And, and that's because he's being brought basically and possibly to the beginning of the 2300 days. He's probably being brought to 457 BC. So he's not writing from the time where he is. He's writing in, in vision from a time in the future. So that this would be a good example of this. <clears throat> so um, he's going to talk about this. So he says, Revelation 17 is much like Daniel 11. While most of the prophecies of these books are dreams and visions of pictorial scenes, these two chapters are largely conversations between an angel and the prophet. We do have another example on a smaller scale of this kind of thing in Revelation 11. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. He says, notice the future tenses. The one speaking to John places both the preaching and the slain of the two witnesses into the future. Thus, the time context of the conversation with John is prior to those events. And yet, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life of God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. So he's going to note here that these are past tenses. Now, you have to be careful when you deal with tenses in, in the Old Testament. That is, Hebrew doesn't have uh, the type of tenses we have. We have all different kinds of tenses. We have future perfect and and past perfect and present perfect and, and all different kinds of ways. And Greek has lots of different tenses. But John, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he's writing in Greek, but he's thinking in Hebrew. That is, you can clearly see uh, he doesn't have, like with his gospel, some Greek writer there to put it all into proper grammar. But he's writing with Hebrew grammar and putting it into Greek language. And so in Hebrew, you don't have these different tenses. All you have is a completed tense and a past tense, which uh, or the completed tense, which is like a past tense, and then an incomplete tense, which is like the future tense. But they don't use it always that way. So God will talk about something, or a prophet will talk about something as having been done, just as a way of saying that it's certain that it will occur, even though it's something in the future. So, so even though he makes this argument about future tenses, and I don't want to get bogged down on this, you have to be quite careful in understanding future tenses and, and completed tenses, because that's how John would think of it. So he could say that something happened in the past. doesn't mean that he's in the future. It just means it's something that's certainly going to happen in this way. But, you know, so I, I'm just saying that you can make, you can make too much about the tenses. And, and there's lots of examples where the tenses don't really make sense, except if you understand the Hebrew way of understanding tenses. So he says, notice the past tenses. Now, John is describing what he actually saw in the vision, not a conversation with some heavenly being. He describes scenes he saw of the future as if they were already past. So this is the thing that's going to, in his mind, in Bob Pickle's mind here, that is going to put us into that the prophet is in the future because he's seen something in vision. He's not being told something. Right. He's he's seen something himself. And so, in a sense, he's in that time when he's seeing this. And, and I think this is a valid point, though, that when John, when John or a prophet sees something in vision as it's happening, he's in that time. He's speaking from that time. He's not going to be speaking from his time. He's going to be speaking from the time in which he's noting that vision. 
we see this in the spirit of prophecy as well. So it's just just kind of natural. But it's an important point because it's one of the problems uh, that we run into when it comes to interpreting the five that are fallen. So he, he's going to have this point of what he's going to say. Whether he's correct or not is not really the issue. We need to understand his point because it is the pioneer's view. When John describes scenes of the future that he saw, he describes them as being past. When John records a conversation explaining future events, he describes those events as if they are yet future. We may safely conclude that the time context of such a conversation is John's day. Thus, when the angel speaks to John in Revelation 17 about the five kings being already fallen, he is speaking of them already being fallen in John's day, not at the end of time. So this would be one of the major issues that we would have with this view. But we're going to see that it's the pioneer's view. And we would have to have an answer to this. And I believe that we do have an answer to it. Um, but we're going to see that, that, that it's not the answer necessarily that we've always given. Okay, so, and people can see this as an important point, I hope. Um, anybody who's dealt with Revelation 17 would know that we would need to know when he says five are fallen, we would have to know where John is when that, that statement is made. says, we could have looked at other passages in Revelation to arrive at the same conclusion, but it may be su- significant that we used Revelation 11. For it is only in Revelation 11 and in Revelation 17 that we find an explicit statement about a beast arising out of a bottomless pit. So um, and these are some interesting points that he has. And so I don't want to just pass by them. Uh, quickly. I want to make sure that people understand them. So if there's something you're not understanding, please comment. Or if there's something that you see that, you know, he misses or I'm missing, please comment on that. So so he's going to look at Revelation 11, and he's going to see there's this connection between Revelation 11 and Revelation 17, and that they talk about a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. So in Revelation 11, 7, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Um, so here we see a beast ascending out of the bottomless pit. Uh this word, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, uh, ascendeth um, is, is, is in the Greek here, it's, it's sort of an active. So it's not, it's not a past tense or a future tense. He's just the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. It's kind of like a present tense. But shall ascend out of the bottomless pit is definitely future tense in Revelation 17. Okay, one last thought on this matter. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So he he talks about this ten horns and these ten kings, and then we're going to have to try to understand that as well. Um, and the time, the time frame. And remember, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11 is what power? What's the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11? Islam. In Revelation 11? You're thinking of Revelation 9. Right, sorry. Okay. And it, it's not a beast that ascends out of France. This is France, right? So France is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. And, and, and so we would have to look at the tense here. Because here he says, when they shall have finished their testimony, it's putting it as something future, or at least 
I'm saying it's present tense, and we're going to have to look at this ascendeth uh, to try to see what that is, because he's sort of a, taking it as a future tense, but it, it's more a present tense, and, and that's an issue. Okay. <clears throat> now, one last thought on this matter. He talks about these ten horns, and 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 we we know that these these horns and these beasts that there is this time frame in which we see them. So one of the things that we understood in this movement is that there is ten toes, there's ten horns, and each of these beasts have ten horns. But are they the same horns in our understanding of these beasts? Or are they different? That is, are all of the horns representative, just as the toes are, of the divided Rome uh, prior to, uh, you know, at the end of the period when we're going to uh, have the transition from pagan to papal Rome? Do we always take the horns as being those ten kingdoms? So do people oh, well, remember? Sure. Check well, remember, well, we, we take the Ten Horns as being United Nations. And we know that three of the horns had already, already been rooted up um, prior to the rise of the papacy. So there was this discussion, too, about the toes. Well, are the toes the Ten Kingdoms? Are those the same kingdoms? Are those the United Nations? So maybe it's not clear to everyone, but I think it's it. My understanding is that we took a position that the toes and the horns, even though there's ten, ten refers to universal, but it doesn't mean that it's always the same ten. That it can be different tens, depending on when you when you are, when you're looking at this, when the prophecy is applied. So this is a position this movement has taken. So he's going to try to argue that the ten horns are the ten kings and they're the same kings and the same horns because that's how the Millerites understood it. Okay. <clears throat> John saw the scenes of a beast and horns as if they already existed, right? So he's in vision. He's going to see these beasts and horns as if they existed after this, he is told that the beast doesn't yet exist again and that the horns have no kingdom yet. So he saw them as if they already existed, but he is told they don't exist yet. This would be true if the time context of the angel's conversation was in John's day. So again, he's going to argue that the context of the conversations are in John's day, not in some future time. But when he's in vision, he's going to see things in this future time. So that's that's the argument. He's making. So hopefully that's clear. So he's going to do some uh, ruling out of ruling out some possibilities. So this this gets a little a little bit off track, but at least we can kind of look at it. So he says, if five kings are already fallen in John's day. We can narrow down the possibilities for the identification of the seven kings. The idea that they are seven popes is out, as well as the idea they are seven kingdoms beginning with Babylon. If they are indeed seven kingdoms, the sequence would have to start with Egypt. For if we start the sequence with Babylon, only the three kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece, would be fallen in John's day. So we looked at this last week. So if you're going to have them to be be in John's day, seven kingdoms. And this was the argument that I was making. That's how we got in this mess, actually. Um, and I'm just going to go there. So I'm going to show you how we got to where we are. So let me go to the Bible here. So if we go to Revelation chapter 12, we're going to see that there's this beast that has seven heads and ten, ten horns. And it's going to have crowns upon its heads. There's going to be seven heads with seven crowns. 
Revelation 13, we're going to see seven heads and ten horns, but there's going to be ten crowns upon the ten horns. So, so they can't be the same. So this, this is a problem that he's going to have to address, which I don't think he really addresses as well as I would like. But um, we know that this is pagan Rome in the time of Christ. And if this is pagan Rome, and Revelation 13 is papal Rome, we would know that we're at a different time. And if the heads are the same, you couldn't say in Revelation 12 that five are fallen. So that's something that has to be quite clear. You, you couldn't say that the beast of Revelation 12 has five heads that are fallen if they're kingdoms, unless you made the kingdoms, Egypt, Assyria, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome Pagan. Uh, and Rome Pagan would be the one that is, and Rome Papal would be the one that's to come. So in trying to understand Revelation 12 as being pagan Rome, we looked at that possibility. So you, you couldn't have it be Babylon. So if we believe that, that the heads are the same, you couldn't say in Revelation 12, at the time when Christ is born, that five are fallen, one is and one is yet to come unless you have them as different nations. So the question was, could we say that the beast of Revelation 12, even though it looks similar, is actually different, that the heads are different than the beast of Revelation 13 or the beast of Revelation 17? And that, of course, creates other problems. And when we looked at this, we looked at the view of the pioneers. And the view of the pioneers is that the seven heads are going to be seven forms of Roman government. So we will look at that. Any questions on this so far? Because I might be moving too fast for people. Because I spend a lot of time on this. So, okay. So we'll go back to the paper. <clears throat> so, if you're going to have them as seven individual emperors, and this is sort of the view that Odilio had, though Odilio wasn't using the beast itself. He was using our understanding of the emperors and the presidents and the kings. So he was, he was taking Daniel 11, verse 1 to 3, and he was also taking... Uh, our understanding of that. And then he was comparing it to this history of the emperors. And he's going to start with Julius Caesar. So he's going to take that, that these are the seven, Caesar, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, and Galba. And so he's going to place Nero as parallel to Trump. So, and we're gonna we're gonna have to come back and look at this again. Now, there are other lists that people have, and, and these are usually preterists, right? So you're gonna have Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, and Titus. Now, Vespasian is the one who's the emperor during the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and Titus is the general. But Vespasian is the one who's ruling then. So he's going to rule till 79, and then Titus begins to rule. Um, so these lists are based upon people's interpretation of, of what's happening um, and what the context is in which John is writing. So he says the problem with the last two lists is there doesn't seem to be any logical reason to exclude the emperors prior to Claudius and Galba are not include Augustus, Tiberius, and Caligula. So one of the things we looked at is who was the emperor at the time of the end in, in, the, in the time of Christ? Because where do we mark the time of the end if we're going to take the reform line in the time of Christ? I guess it was the last one, wasn't it? Okay, but well, in the time of Christ, when Christ is born, we have the time of the end. 
right? Because we have the light of Christ. We're going to have the time of the end. We're going to have a period of darkness. The people that walked in darkness saw a great light. That's going to be Christ. So when do we mark the time of the end in Christ's line? Anybody remember? Because we have the time of the end in our time, 1989. We have in Millerite history, 1798. So where's the time of the end in the time of Christ? The type of yours, is the... No? Okay. Well, we will have... Hey, what, what, the event that we mark is the birth of Christ marks the time of the end, correct? Yep. Because you're right. going to have John the Baptist coming. He's, he's also there as well. So some people well, that, mark John the Baptist. That, that would be Julius then, wouldn't it? That would be Augustus. Or Augustus. Yeah. In the time of the Caesar Augustus, there went out a decree that all the world should be taxed. Caesar has died long before that, in like 45 or whatever. Okay. So you, BC. So you got Augustus. So Augustus Caesar is – so if we were going to count seven, we would start with Augustus, right? He's going to be the first. You wouldn't, you wouldn't count Julius Caesar. He's, he's not there. So you would have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba. And then you would have to say, well, the seventh is going to be Otho. But th th that wouldn't really make sense. I mean, none of that would fit five or fallen one is, one's yet to come. Um, so we, we proposed an idea where we took Galba, uh, Otho, and Vitellius and ignored them. And we just took the ones that were relevant uh, to the time of Christ. So we're going to have uh, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. And then you're going to have Vespasian. And then the one that's going to come would be Titus. Even though Titus destroys Jerusalem in the time of Vespasian, he's going to be counted as the seven heads. So that was just one way of looking at it, trying to understand um, Odilio's uh, paralleling that to the time of the end in our time. So trying to parallel the Caesars with the kings or the presidents of the United States. And we know that Caesar is not actually an emperor, right? He's a dictator. And Imperial Rome begins with Augustus. So that's when they create the emperors. Plus the time of the end isn't in the time of Caesar. So, so the first list necess necessitates that John be exiled in Patmos during the reign of Nero, which seems unlikely. We know that uh, during the reign of Nero, that's going to end in, I'm just trying to remember, I think it's going to be, because Nero's reign is going to end in, and then after Nero, you're going to have Galba, so it's going to be like 60. Anybody remember the years? I'm always getting these mixed up. But anyway, you're going to have the year of the four, four emperors. So when Nero dies, you're going to have Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and then finally Vespasian. All of those are going to be emperors in the year um, 69 AD. So I think it's in 68 when uh, Nero dies. And... Um, Julius Caesar was never really an emperor. And what would be the point of ending with Galba? What would be the point of the prophecy? So he asked some good questions if you're going to try to make these emperors to be the seven heads. And then he's going to address the ten kings. So Daniel 7.24 also speaks of ten horns, representing ten kings, which parallel Daniel 2's ten toes. So we got the ten toes and the ten horns. And would we agree that the ten kings or the ten horns that represent ten kings and the ten toes are the same in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, that they were referred to the same kingdoms. Yeah, same. I would think so. Uh, repeat an enlargement, I would think so. Okay. So, so we would take that position. That's pretty much a standard Adventist position. I know that Parminder was trying to create doubt or confusion, at least, regarding that. 
um, there was a lot of talk about the clay. I don't know if you remember all that. Um, hopefully you've forgotten most of it. Okay, anyway, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So we have our understanding of this is that we have these ten toes. These are the same as the ten horns, and that it's in the time of these ten toes, toes or ten kings that Christ sets up his kingdom. These ten kings rise out of the fourth kingdom in both Daniel 2 and 7. The four kingdoms are Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. When Rome broke up in the 5th century, ten nations arose in Western Europe, most of which still exist today. What Daniel 2.44 is telling us is that these kingdoms will still be around when Jesus returns at his second coming. Clearly, the ten kings of Daniel 2 and 7 are still around at the end of time. If the ten horns of Revelation 17 are also ten kings at the end of time, they must be the same ten kings as those in Daniel 2 and 7. Otherwise, we would have 20 kings, two sets of ten at the end of time. Now, anybody have some answer to what he says in this, these two sentences, the last paragraph there. What would be the problem with this reasoning? So he's saying, if they're the same 10 king, 10 toes, and they exist to the end of time, if we have another set of 10, that means there's actually 20. So they'd have to be the same set of 10. What, what would be the problem with this argument that he's making? For me, yeah, there, it would kind of conflict. Um, um, so the Bible say, um, well, the the ten, you know, kings, they're not given a kingdom as yet. Yeah. You know, um, so some, some of the criteria, in my opinion, wouldn't fit, but I'll just leave it there. Okay, well, he's, he's going to answer that that one by basically saying that when it talks about that's the conversation one, and so that's something that still hasn't happened in John's day, that he's talking in a conversation. When he's a conversation, he's going to be talking from the first century A.D. So those ten kingdoms wouldn't have, to have had a kingdom as yet. But I would think the problem here is that don't we understand ten to be a symbol? But do we believe that there is actually ten nations that survived? Because wouldn't, weren't three of those horns plucked up? Correct. So, and so even ten is just dead. a symbol for completion or complete. And, and we see it, we see it, you know, dealing with the ten different nations at different times that are symbolically representing uh, um, the Gentile world. So, ten here can't be taken literally because when we talk about the United Nations, we don't need to take the number ten literally we would see the number 10 as representing universality as far as the world is concerned. But the United Nations has the world divided into 10 different regions, right? No, not that I could find. I've heard that. I haven't been able to find it. The papacy does. But I haven't found that the United Nations does. And you can find that in the book... Um, Keys of This Blood by uh, Malachi Martin. He talks about the ten divisions that the papacy uses. And I think people just kind of conflated the two. They just assume that the United Nations divides the world into ten because the papacy does. Oh, well, maybe maybe that's what I'm doing. But yeah, uh, because but, I seen the map. I, see, I seen the map, but I just... yeah, there is a map, but the papacy's yeah. map. That's the one I've seen. Okay. So, but, but yeah, I've heard people say it's the United Nations. I haven't found that that's the case, but I could be wrong. Maybe I just haven't found it. Okay. But anyway, we know that the number 10 doesn't have to be taken literally. Because even if you talked about the world being divided into 10 things by the United Nations, nobody knows about that, right? It's just that these are the United Nations. They're universal. 
in that sense. So, so understanding things as a symbol, that would, that would be the argument I would have against that. So I would say that the 10 toes represent that universality at a certain time during the time in which Rome goes from pagan to papal. But the 10 horns in Revelation 17 would represent that universal kingdom that now is the whole world. It's not just relegated to Europe. And this, this idea that it's relegated to Europe is something we'll see in evangelistic series all the time, right? We'll see that the 10 toes of Europe and, and we'll look at, um, you know, they'll never be able to cleave one to another. So, you know, when they had the European Union, there was lots being made about that, um, these types of ideas. And that's because we would say that the 10, to 10 toes of the 10 kingdoms are Europe. But we can see that in our understanding of that, that's universal. That's the United Nations, not just Europe itself. And, and the other thing about it is we know that where is the United Nations located? America. USA. In the USA. So to us, that becomes an important part of understanding the prophecy. Okay. So now he's going to address the seven kings themselves. Now, this part, is, he's going to talk about the seven mountains as seven hills. Now, you'll see people arguing that they're not really mountains, that Rome's seven hills aren't mountains. Now, what's the difference between a mountain and a hill? You know, mountains can represent... Uh church king of god no but i just mean in a literal sense like if, oh, if you're going to yeah. say that something's a mountain or something's a hill what's the difference how do you decide if something's a mountain or something's a hill the height is quite a bit bigger so. okay how much bigger how big does something have to be to be a mountain and not a hill well we're talking about you know a couple of miles of difference so <laughs> But it's, it's not something that's easy definable because sometimes we'll talk about, if you look in Jerusalem and they talk about mountains, some of the things that they call mountains. Like Mount Olives is not that big. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that they're, they're, that they're hills, right? I wouldn't even call them mountains. I mean, what about Mount Zion? Is Mount Zion a mountain or a hill? A hill. It's a hill. It's a hill. Yeah. But the Bible calls it a mountain. And and there's not really much difference between and prior to the flood, you know, the you know, they call it mountains there too, but uh the mountains were not like we see the mountains today, so for right. sure. So it's, yeah. Yeah. The mountains today are much bigger than the mountains in the time of the flood. I mean talking symbolically here. Yeah, well, but, but even symbolically, we, we need to at least understand, literally, people will say, well, the seven hills of Rome aren't mountains, so they can't be the seven heads that are being talked about. But all I'm just saying is that when it comes to defining what a hill and a mountain is, in the Bible, they talk about things as mountains that we would call hills, right? So, so there isn't a difference between a mountain and a hill. It's just another word that really describes the same thing. It's, it's not something that's distinct. You can't, even though we might do that in English, we might say, well, that's a hill, that's a mountain. But we're not always in agreement even on that. So it's going to talk about the seven hills of Rome, the Aventine, the Palatine, the Capitoline, the Salian, the Quirinial, uh, the Viminial, and the Esquiline. And to these we can add an eighth, more on that later. There are supposed to have been seven kings re reigning in Rome before the Roman Republic was fo founded around 509 BC. Romulus, Numa, Pompilius, all these different guys' names, doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's a bunch of Latin. To this list, we can add an eighth. Titus Tatius ruled jointly with Rome, of whom he was a king, united with the Romans. 
Uh, the history or legend of Rome's founding tells us about the kings and the hills. Romulus first built in the Palatine and then the Capitoline, right, and so forth. Now, now this I thought was sort of, this isn't really talking about any of the thing we've been studying, uh, but he's just trying to address this problem that other people have looked at. Um, he says, um, while Emperor Aurelian, during his reign from 270 to 275 AD, extended Rome's walls further than these hills, the old wall of Servius included just these seven, most of the Chalian and Esquiline and all of the other five, within Roman limits. This wall of Servius was named after the sixth king, who had supposedly extended the walls that far, but modern authorities feel it was built after the Gauls destroyed Rome in 390 BC, regardless of which is true. In John's day, there were just seven hills enclosed in, by the walls of Rome. Now, he brings up this point, and you'll see why. Okay, Since all of the seven original kings of Rome were kings of Rome, and since all the seven hills of Rome were within the walls of Rome, it would make sense for the seven kings of Revelation 17 to also all be in some way a part of Rome. This suggests that we should consider the idea that the seven kings of Revelation 17 are seven forms of government within Rome. So this is the pioneer view. Now, he's going to jump over here to the crowns, and, and I don't quite agree with him on, on these crowns and the heads. But well, let's take a look at this. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. The crowns are upon the heads. Why? While the dragon is primarily Satan, it is also secondarily pagan Rome. We know this from the spirit of prophecy. Since it was through pagan Rome that Satan persecuted the church after Christ's accession, ascension. Revelation 12, 5, 6, 12, 13. Since pagan Rome had a strong central government, having crowns upon the seven heads of the dragon makes sense. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So you're going to see now in Revelation 13, um, the beast that rises up out of the sea is not the same beast that we see in Revelation 12. That is, on the 1843 chart, we're going to see that the beast of Revelation 12 is called Pagan Rome, and the beast of Revelation 13 is called Papal Rome. And he's got written on his head the name Blasphemy. Right. So that we can see that that's, yeah. So that's going to, to address, and, and this there's some real interesting details that we're going to look at when it comes to this as we get into Revelation 13 deeper. And I, I was going to start to do that today, though, I wasn't really planning to read this paper and, and getting ready for the study. I realized I probably need to read this so that people know where I'm coming from and what I'm trying to do. So, so we're going to see that this beast here is, is obviously papal Rome, not pagan Rome. There's no crowns upon the heads. Instead, they are upon the horns. Why? Papal Rome was not the strong central government that pagan Rome had been. Papal Rome consisted of independent sovereign nations held together by a common religion headed by the Pope. Crowns upon the horns instead of on, upon the heads symbolize this fact. It was the horns that were sovereign, not the beast itself. So if we're going to look at, at what he's talking about here, I'm, I'm just going to go to Revelation 13. Um, now, we did the study on Revelation 12. So remember in Revelation 12, it's going to start with the birth of Christ, with the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and that this is going to lead to the time of the papacy. It's going to, it's going to persecute them, and, and they're going to flee into the wilderness for 1260 years. And, and so we have to take the position that – when we get to Revelation 13, we aren't in John's day. Now, he is in vision. That is, it isn't a conversation. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, right? 
I saw, so he's in vision. I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death. So we know that the head that's wounded to death couldn't be in John's day, correct? Right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. yeah. So, so this is going to relate to how we understand Revelation 17, because the position that we've always taken is the head that receives the deadly wound is the one in Revelation 17 that um, is, is, is not, right? So there's going to be the one that is, that's not going to be the one that receives, it's going to be, it's going to be dead, so to speak. So he's though going to look at this quite differently, right? So he's going to look at the, the head that's wounded to death as not being the papacy. Or it could be the papacy, but not, not in the way that we see it. That is, it wouldn't be the fifth head. Because the seventh head, in his understanding, as you'll see, is the papal head. And so he would have to be the one that receives the deadly wound would have to be the papal head. That would be the seventh head, not the fifth. So that is, when it talks about five are fallen and one is, he's not equating the falling, the fallen, with the heads that's wounded. Right. You, you understand what I'm saying? So we take the position that the, the head that's wounded is the fifth because five are fallen. But he takes the position that the head that's wounded is the papacy at the end because it's the seventh kingdom. So, so I know it's a little bit hard to get. It was hard to get my mind around to how he saw this. But this is the, the pioneer view. So, um, so we're going to have these. Hello, guys. Hi, Mark. Hi, guys. And I start to texting you. Do you call me? Okay. You go well, on my own. My other text, I just sent you. I let you hurt me. Well, I didn't. But I have children. Okay, I see that. Yeah, that was a while ago, I guess, eh? Okay, thanks, Mark. Yes. Anyway, so just enjoy the study. Sure. Okay, so so we see that this there's this difference between the pioneer view and our view, and we're going to have to try to reconcile that. Um, and we're going to see that the deadly wound will be healed and all the world wondered after the beast. So... If it's the seventh head that's wounded and that's healed, that's much different than to say it's the fifth head. Um, okay, Jeff, did you have a comment? I was just, I was just saying that what you said, much different, yes. Yeah, that just kind of sounded distorted. I couldn't tell what you said. Okay, so, so we're still going to look at this view, but you can see the problem here, that there's, there's definitely a difference. Um, but we can see that this is all in vision. Um, so it's not a conversation like you see in Revelation 17. And, and that's where he's making this difference. And he's going to deal with the beast that comes out of the earth. Now, again, he's going to be in vision, seeing a beast coming up out of the earth. Again, that's the present tense. So that means in vision, he's going to be in 1798. But he's arguing that he can't be in 1798 or in some future time in Revelation 17 because he's having a conversation. That's going to be his argument. So we have to try to address that. Okay, so let's go back to his paper. So he says, a, a similar picture is found in Daniel 2. Clay holds together iron fragments, somewhat. 
in the feet and toes. Likewise, the beast holds together somewhat the ten horns with their crowns. During the Middle Ages, what unity there was between the nations of Europe was only somewhat. It was the papacy that provided a unifying force, but whatever unity was achieved was never complete. Constantly there was political intrigue, political differences, and outright war. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The beast of Revelation 17 has no crowns at all, suggesting that the form of government being represented by this beast is one that has no king. Indeed, this thought is not new. The beast that was denotes the Roman Republic that was 1900 years ago and is not, that is, not when John was having his vision in 96 AD because Imperial Rome was then the form of government and continued to be until 538 when the seventh form of government, that is the papacy, even he is the eighth. The eighth undoubtedly is, as we have shown, the two-horned beast with its image, a symbol of the people of Republican America, as they are and will be and is of the seven. The eighth will cause all under his influence to worship the one that is called the seventh. So this is Joseph Bates writing in 1851. This is in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. So August 5th, 1851. So what is Joseph Bates saying? Maybe everybody can't pick up on it because it's, it's kind of unfamiliar with this. Uh, we're not familiar with this view. So when he says that it, he is the eighth and the eighth is of the seven, he says that, um, that the papal Rome is the seventh form. So what what is he saying? Can anybody kind of put this? Um, or, 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 or well, think? it looks like he's saying that, that, that he's he's the seventh, the papal form, and mm -hmm. and he uh, he loses he loses his he loses the uh, he's wounded he's wounded to death, but not. But only because of this state, the, the state, the state okay. is separate. So, yeah. and then he gains he gains his power and he becomes the eighth, but he's of the seventh. So, yeah. So what he's what he's arguing is the eighth is the United States. That is, that's the two horned beast, and okay. it's one and it's one of the forms of government. That is, it's the republican form of Roman government that the United States displays. So the seventh head of Rome itself is Papal Rome. That's the so when it receives a deadly wound, that's the end of Papal Rome. And the beast that's going to arise from the earth is the United States. It's the eighth. That's that's what Joseph Bates is saying. And it's of the seven because it's a form of government that is one of the forms of government of Rome, particularly republicanism. So uh, Bob Pickle says, the present author would differ a little with the above, but the point is that Bates identifies the beast of Revelation 17, the one without crowns, as being a republic, a revival of the republicanism of old Rome, a republicanism that was dead at the time John wrote the book of Revelation. This coincides with the idea that the absence of crowns indicates a government that has no king. So I'd read this before in Miller's writings and um, I, I didn't really understand the point because I didn't fully understand the argument. And, and so we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to address this. How do we address the difference that we have from the pioneer's understanding of this? Now, um, here we have a search for a common tie. So this, this is an interesting point that he brings out. So four passages are linguistically tied together in Revelation, while their typical interpretations have been totally unrelated. So we're going to see Revelation 9. Uh,
what what's being what he's pointing to here. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So we know that that's referring to Islam. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, we can see the bottomless pit is that thing that ties it together. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, Revelation 17, verse 8. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, Revelation 13, 11. Typically, historicists have identified the beast from the bottomless pit in chapter 11 as being France during its revolution, while the beast of the bottomless pit of chapter 17 has been identified as a revived papacy. The king, the angel of the bottomless pit of chapter 9, has been identified in some way with Islam, um, and then the beast of Revelation 13 has no crowns on either his head or his horns. Just like the beast of Revelation 17 has been identified with the United States for very different interpretations. Is there nothing that ties these symbols together? There indeed is something, and that something is republicanism. An atheistic brand of republican or democracy wreaked havoc during the French Revolution. A Protestant brand of republicanism gave birth to the freedoms found in the United States. And the Muslims? In Mecca, despotism was impossible. The fierce, free, fierce, freeborn Arabs of the desert would tolerate no master, and their innate democracy had been sanctioned by the Prophet, who had explicitly declared that all believers were brothers. The Meccan Caliphate was a theocratic democracy. Abu Bakr and Omar were elected by the people and held themselves responsible to public opinion. So that's from the New World of Islam by Lothrop Stoddard. Anyway, so when we read, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition, we are reading about a confederacy of republics, a revival of the republican form of government of old Rome. Republicanism and democracy is the only conceivable tie between the four passages. So it's a very, very odd understanding. It's something I still have to try to get my mind around, that you're going to put the United States in with Islam, um, uh, with the papacy, and, uh, and in its different forms, right, and, and France. So you've got Islam, France, papacy, the United States, all having this characteristic we call republicanism, which we would look at as a good thing. So it says, so when we read the beast that was is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition, we are reading about a confederacy of republics. So, so we're going to see that I, I'm not sure if this completely makes sense if I buy into his argument here, but it's something to think about. It, and that wouldn't be the pioneer view. They never tied those together. He has. Okay, this beast, that beast, which beast? Okay, Revelation talks about the dragon and several beasts. How do we keep from confusing one beast with another? Um, Revelation 13 gives us a clue. The first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10, seems to be consistently called throughout the book, the beast. The second beast of 13, 11 is identified as another beast. And then there is never, and then is never called a beast again. Instead, to prevent confusion, he is called the false prophet. In Revelation 16, 13, 9, 20, 19, 20, and 2012, 2012, 2010, in all three of these passages, he appears alongside the beast. Both are pictured together. One is called the beast, and the other is called the false prophet. What this suggests is that whenever we read about the beast, we must be reading about the first beast of Revelation 13. If John sees things that he has already seen before, he prefaces his words with the. If he has seen something new, he omits the the. That would be a Hebrew way of doing it. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, Revelation 17.3. Apparently, John is indicating that he has seen something new, 
something different than the beast he saw in Revelation 16, 13. We would then expect that in every place afterwards where the first beast of Revelation 13 is intended, he will be identified as the beast. In every place where the beast of Revelation 17 is intended, some sort of qualifier will be added to enable us to distinguish him from the first beast of Revelation 13. So this point is going to be something we have to examine um, as we continue to move through uh, this study. Because we're going to, we're not really studying Revelation 17 yet. I'm mostly trying just to, to look at Revelation 13. That to me is the main focus of this study. Um, even though he's talking about Revelation 17, to me it's, it's understanding Revelation 13, the heads there, and, and Revelation 12 as well. Um, what makes this more apparent is the fact that Revelation 16, 13 pictures the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, all involved in getting people to the battle of Armageddon. Then we have the scarlet beast of Revelation 17. Then we have an actual picture of the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, uh, verse 19 and onward, in which the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are clearly seen. Clearly, the beast of 1613 must be the same as the beast of 1920. Inasmuch as the scarlet beast of chapter 17 is a beast instead of the beast, he must be totally different beasts set apart by some sort of qualifiers whenever he is mentioned. So we already understand, at least we've taken the position, that these beasts can't be the same thing. We know that the beast of Revelation 12 can't be the beast of Revelation 13, where he's trying to argue that um, that the beast of Revelation 13 is the beast when it talks about the beast. The great red dragon isn't really the beast. It is a beast. The beast of Revelation 13 is the beast. And then the beast of Revelation 17 would be different. Now, we already know that there are some differences. They look different. They appear to be operating in a different time, at least from our understanding of things. But we also know that um, you know they, they have different characteristics regarding the crowns and the heads. We know the beast of Revelation 13 is a composite beast that has characteristics of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome in its symbolism. You know, it has, I uh, um, can't remember all the different parts, but feet as a bear, um, can't remember what it has as a leopard. I think the skin of a leopard and the mouth of a lion, right? I think that's how it goes. So, so he's saying that we need to be clear in Revelation 17 when it's talking about the beast that was and is not, and yet is, it's not talking about the beast upon which the woman is sitting. Okay. <clears throat> and anybody have any questions at this point? Okay, hopefully you, you, you sent out this article on to, you emailed it to everyone or yeah, I emailed it. Yeah. And I know it's going to take a bit of time to digest it. I mean, I, I've read it three times. This is the fourth time. When did you email it? Because I don't recall. I, I emailed it like a couple hours ago. Oh. Okay. Oh, recently. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that's, I did. That, that's why I haven't seen it. So. <laughs> yeah. Because originally I wasn't going to read this article. But once I was reading, getting ready for the study today, then I realized I needed to read it. So I better send it out to people. But, but we're going to come back to it. So even right now, I'm introducing these ideas. We're definitely going to come, have to come back to it and address it um, and, 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 and sort of tear it apart, tear apart his argument um, in certain places. There's some points, though, that I think uh, that we need to see. One is I do believe that the pioneers were correct, at least in part. And especially we're going, to, we're going to deal with the beast in Revelation chapter 12. We would have to take their position as, um, as pretty solid. The question is, how do we understand, how can we take our view 
and how can how can it line up with the pioneer view? And and we know in the article that Uriah Smith had written, he basically would dismiss our view as not correct um, because he takes the pioneer view as Bob Pickle does. Okay, so he's going to do a verse by verse analysis. Uh, the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Which beast? Clearly the qualifier identifies the, this beast as the one John just saw, the scarlet beast. The beast that saw, thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, Revelation 17, 8. Which beast? The scarlet beast. Republican was the order of the day before Augustus Caesar. It was not in John's day, and it would ascend and be a dominant force in the end. So his view is very, very different, as you can see here. Interestingly, not until World War I did this even begin to come true, though it almost did during the revolutions of 1848. During the World, World War I, the monarchies of Turkey, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Russia all met their demise, and the world has been marching on toward a confederacy of republics and democracies ever since. Not that communist Rus Russia filled, fit the bill, but that's where the world has been heading ever since World War I. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. As mentioned before, the interpretation being suggested here typically identifies the first five kings as being five of the following forms of Roman of, of government. Kings, consuls, dictators, decemvirate, military tribunes with consular power, and the triumvirate. Some expositors have left out military tribunes and have left out the triumvirate, but both of these were legitimate heads of the government at one time or another. Perhaps the simplest solution to needing to choose five of the six is to start with the founding of the Republic in 509 BC. This then leaves out the monarch monarchical form of government from the list. Would this be permissible? The records of the seven monarchs who reigned before the Republic start with Romulus. His father is said to be the god Mars, and he was suckled as an infant by a she-wolf. Obviously, there are aspects of the story that are fictitious. For such reasons, the list of seven kings is often called legendary. The last three of the seven monarchs were Etruscans, not Romans. After the founding of the Republic in 509 BC, we have Rome being ruled by Romans. This suggests that perhaps we should start the five at that time. Daniel 7 said that Rome was diverse from all other beasts before it, and it was. Babylon, Persia, and Grecian Empire, founded by Alexander, did not repeatedly change their form of government like Rome did. They also were monarchies, not republics. Rome indeed was diverse. And one is, the imperial form of government was the one that existed in John's day. This would be the sixth head, and the others not yet come. And when he cometh, he must be must continue a short space. Some have suggested that the seventh head was the exarch of Ravenna, since he didn't rule from Rome. This does not seem likely. Each of the seven heads should be a form of government that ruled from the seven-hilled city of Rome. It therefore seemed seems more probable that this seventh head is the medieval papacy. Yet how could this 1260-year-long reign be considered a short space? Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now the other argument I would use here is that the 1260 years <coughs> is a portion of a longer time prophecy. It's a short time, not in the sense of just momentary, but it's also a period of time that is um, 
part of a longer period. So it's shortened, if that makes sense. So that's that's the argument I would 25, use. 2520 or 2520? That's part of the 2520, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it's part of the 2520 prophetic mirror. So it's even part of a bigger thing than just the 2520 itself. This is spoken probably soon after Christ's ascension. The short time, the devil would then last from Christ's ascension to the end of time. If the last 2,000 years can be called a short time, surely 1,260 years can be called a short space. Now, see, and again, I'm going to take this short time here as, as being part of a time prophecy. That it's not just that it's a short time, but it's, it's part of his structure. The devil knows that he has a short time because he understands the time prophecies involved. The beast that was and is not, he, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Which beast? The qualifier points back to verse 8, which in turn pointed us to the scarlet beast. So the scarlet beast of Revelation 17 must be the eighth king. Interestingly, there is an eighth hill of great significance over at Rome. It sits across on the other side of the Tiber River from the original seven. It is the Vatican. Aurelian's walls never surrounded it. Until five, or 850 AD, it sat outside of Rome. After the papacy returned from Avignon, France, in the 1370s, the Vatican Hill became the headquarters of the papacy. Thus we have a prophecy that the world in the end of time will become a conglomeration of republics and democracies under the spiritual leadership of a papacy, the grand headquarters of which will be upon the eighth hill. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. So this wouldn't be a pioneer view here that he's presenting. This is something that he's developed, as far as I can see or he's taken from someone else, but it would be consistent with the pioneer view. A popular ren rendering of the phrase one hour has been at the same time. Thus, these ki ten kings already identified with the ten toes and horns of Daniel 2 and 7 receive their kingdom at the same, at the same time as the beast. Which beast? Since there are no qualifiers here, the beast referred to would be the first beast of chapter 13, not the scarlet beast of chapter 17. That being so, we have a picture here of the 10 nations of Western Europe coming to power at the same time as the papacy did. And that is precisely what happened during the century. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. This indeed happened during the Middle Ages, but it would appear that the prophet is speaking more specifically of end time events Thus, we have a prediction that the ten horns, now republics and democracies, instead of monarchies, will again surrender their sovereignty in some way to the papal power. Similar wording is used in verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So what has he done here that is significant? I mean, there's lots of things here. Has he opened up the door for us to take the pioneer understanding and expand upon it by looking at a repeat of history? That would be an interesting premise. Okay. So when we look at our understanding, because I'm of the opinion that God has been leading this movement and that we have an understanding of Revelation 17 that I don't think we can just completely abandon just because the pioneers didn't hold this view. But I think we would have to see our, our understanding as an application, as a repeat of history, which we hadn't quite understood. And I haven't sorted it all out yet, but um, there's some things that are quite compelling, and I don't know what other people think about this, but we, we will have to look at this in more detail as we move through these studies. Now, 
and and we know that we already do this, right? We do this with Daniel 11, verse 1 to 3, correct? We take a history and we repeat that history and we apply it to the United States and we have solid uh, grounds to do, do so. We're using Miller rules. We understand the end from the beginning. We can see that what happens at the end of Daniel chapter 11 is is typified by the events that happen all throughout chapter 11, correct? Yes. Okay. So what I'm suggesting, what I'm seeing here is that if we are to understand Revelation correctly, we should see the same type of thing that we have in our understanding of Daniel chapter 11. And Colin's study agrees with that application. That is, an Odilio study agrees with that application. And, and what Jeff had brought out in, in 2015, 2016 is agreeing with that application and, and that continued to unfold. That in order to understand prophecy and its application, we need to understand the repeat of history because the key to the to the future and to the present is the past. And any thoughts on that? We have to have the application from history in order to properly properly place where we are on these lines. Right. And, and, and if we're going to understand this repeat of history, because, and, and, and again, I haven't sorted it all out, but, but the thing that we saw is that, and, and this is what Parminder was trying to do, is he was trying to create confusion on this issue. And, and what he was trying to confuse us about with the toes and the horns, all this type of confusion, to basically... Uh, to undermine this message, because it was actually an undermining of this message. I understand now, looking back retrospectively, but at the time, I didn't see what he was doing. But we don't have to take the symbols of the ten toes and the ten horns and make their original application different. We just need to see that we can take an application of them and put it in the future because history is repeated. That's what this movement has taught. And that when we lay up out these lines, what we're doing is we're taking the past fulfillment of prophecy and we're seeing it repeated in our history. And then we can understand if we have the correct interpretation of that prophecy, and we can lay them all over top of each other, then it can give us the details for us to understand our present situation. Because we're at the end of the world. It's the effect of every vision. Would, would people agree with what I've said there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. So, so I do think that we have to go back and look at Revelation 12, 13, and 17 and understand them a little bit differently. But I don't think it's going to give us a huge um, – it's, it's not going to be a rejection of our message. We're going to see that it's going to give us more clarity in understanding how we have made these applications and why. And it's going to protect us from error because we have the past to guide us in the present and in the future. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to read this again here. So he says, which beast, since there is no qualifiers here, the beast referred to would be the first beast of chapter 13, not the scarlet beast of chapter 17. That being so, we have a picture here of the 10 nations of Western Europe coming to power at the same time as the papacy did. And that is precisely what happened in the fifth century. He's of one mind, 
They shall give their power and strength unto the beast. This indeed happened during the Middle Ages, but it would appear that the prophet is speaking more specifically of end time events. Thus, we have a prediction that the ten horns, now republics and democracies instead of monarchies, will again surrender their sovereignty in some way to the papal power. Similar wording is used in verse 17. Who God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The woman who sits upon the scarlet beast must certainly be a representation of at least the papacy. Thus, when the ten kings give the kingdom to the beast, this is the same as saying that they are giving their kingdom to the woman. For this reason, she was pictured riding upon the scarlet colored beast whom she had under her control. Yet a predicted change is to come. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and she shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The very ones who gave her power would be the instruments of taking it away. Thus it was in 1798. The French nation was to a large extent responsible for the papacy's initial power. The very same nation took away, took that power away. Okay, so when we were going through an understanding of uh, examining the foundation, we really came to understand something quite clear. Is there a Sunday law in 538? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we also came to understand, um, and this was uh, me and Stephen most worked on this, but in 538, what happened on December 25th? It was, a, it, we usually had put this on another year, but we came to understand that something happened on December 25th in 538. What was it? Sunday law. Okay. It was the baptism of Clovis. So most people would put the baptism of Clovis in 496 AD. But as we've, we've done in a, some studies, we've come to understand that his baptism was actually in 538. And it's a symbol of the Sunday law, correct? Because on our line is December 25th, the symbol of the Sunday law. Yes. Yeah, December 25th, 2021, it's the symbol of the Sunday law. We had already understood that. And, and we have other December 25th, 25th days of the 12th month is when uh, Jehoiachin was released from prison. And so we've looked at those December 25th. But one of the things we see that is in 538, he's pointing out this point that, that we had looked at many times, is France is the one that puts the papacy upon the throne of the world. Right. It, it gives it its throne. Yes. Okay. Now, France is the one that, now, we know that, that it's going to be happening as the Roman Empire falls, the powers see the great authority, but it's France that finally places the papacy there and gives it the persecutory power. France becomes the, um, the military for the papacy, but it's also going to be the one that's going to take the papacy off the throne of the world in 1798 so so we have these histories that are types and we definitely can apply them at the end of the world if we understand them correctly in the past <clears throat> okay so it says these shall make war with the lamb the lamb shall overcome them for he is lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful we are thus given a view of the political landscape of the world at the time of the Battle of Armageddon, under the spiritual leadership of the papacy, a conglomeration of republics and democracies unite in rebellion against the mild and beneficent rule of Christ. So this is the United Nations, but seen in a different way, as a repeat of history. Okay, so... Um, so I'm going to just leave this rest here for now. He's just going to quote a bunch of different people, Uriah Smith, Adam Clark, William Miller, and so forth. And then he's going to have some questions, but we're not going to look at that because I don't want to go later. Okay, so hopefully this was helpful for people. I want people to go through this study. Um, 
and, and we're definitely going to look at Revelation 13 a little bit more next week at the rise of the United States and what Ellen White says about it and the significance of how we take this in the context of what he's saying and, and what, what um, Joseph Bates had said. Any questions? Mm, no other questions, but I went, I went through... Uh... Jeff Pippinger's uh, had like a table that's number 59 and mm -hmm. 60 where he, he addresses okay. there. I went through that again. So, okay. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, one of the things that we can see here is in examining the foundation and going back to the old paths, we're going to find that, you know, God has been leading this movement, but it doesn't mean our understanding is complete, yeah. but we saw this with Miller. Miller understood the 2520, the starting date. It was given to him. But did he understand Leviticus 26 correctly? He didn't have no. the four seven times, right? He, he didn't understand how it was fulfilled with literal Israel. But he had the correct answer. It's like somebody doing math, and they get the correct answer, uh, even though they did their work wrong in some ways. And... And this is how God has been leading this movement. But by going back to the past, it gives us more light on our understanding as we move forward. And, and that's the thing that I find fascinating, is that every time that we have done this, that we've gone back to the pioneers, and we saw that there's some difference in how we understood things and the pioneers understood things, that they really weren't true differences. They were just incomplete and by understanding their views, it helps us in understanding our view. And that's why we're doing these this exercise and going through these things. So hopefully people can can spend some time on their own studying these things. Um, we, we still have a lot of work to do before we get to the end of this whole study, because we have to go, as I said before, we have to go through the seven uh, kings of Media Persia. We have to go through the seven the last seven kings of Judah. We have to go through the, the last seven kings of Israel, the first seven kings of Judah, the first seven kings of Israel, uh, the presidents. Seven and, stands. And, what's that? Seven. Seven stands as seven churches. Yes, exactly. Okay, so if there's no more questions or comments, we can close with prayer. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful uh, for the time that we have on the Sabbath to study together, to have fellowship. And we just ask, Lord, that we can continue to study your word and understand it correctly. We pray for each person that your angels can watch over them. We pray uh, for the meetings on Sabbath, the studies, and um, for those that are traveling, that you can give them safety. And we ask, Lord, that you can speak to us individually, that we can know that you are near. We can know your presence and that we can obey your voice and that we can walk with you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen.